Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session number two of our discussion of Inferno by Dante. Uh, glad to see you guys back here again. Um, uh, I, I was uh, really glad to hear that a bunch of people were uh, enjoying our discussion last time. I think that was really good. Let me, before I forget, I want to begin with an observation uh, that Lee Smith made over Twitter, um, uh, because I'm going to forget if I don't say it, but it's a really wonderful uh, thing. She was talking about, she had been listening asynchronously, and she was talking, when, when we were discussing the significance of Dante writing in Italian, uh, she was talking about the importance or the um, sort of the irony, but the significance of the fact that he, by doing this, right, by making Virgil a character, we're going to meet Virgil tonight, by making Virgil, uh, you know, one of the main characters of his Italian poem, he's having Virgil, the greatest of all of the Latin poets, speak in Italian, right? Which does a couple different things. Um, on the one hand, it does as, and this I think was the primary point that Lee was getting at in her tweet, um, was that in doing, she's not, he's not like competing with Virgil, right? Like if, I mean, how do you, how do you give Virgil Latin lines, <laughs> right? I mean, like, how could you write this poem in Latin in that sense? Like, you know, you're just like, clearly trying to one-up Virgil. Um, and that's true. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, one could also say, um, well, he's also trying to one-up Virgil, <laughs> right? Not by doing exactly what he did, you know, like again or better um, in the same way, not like actually stepping in his footprints and trying to be like, I'm going to write like the sequel exactly, you know, to the Aeneid essentially or something like that. I'm going to, I'm going to, again, I'm going to put Latin words in Virgil's mouth. Um, but by putting instead Italian words uh, in Virgil's mouth, it's also like giving your own Italian verse, like, you know, the authority of the greatest Latin writer of all time. I mean, one of the things that your standard literary snob you know, of like the 1290s might have said, you know, had you gone to them and been like, well, I think I'm going to write my great epic in Italian, they would probably have said, what? Oh, you know, you know, surely you must walk in the footsteps of Virgil, right? I mean, like, obviously Virgil has shown that only Latin is capable of, you know, like the, 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 the elegance and the grandeur of this sort of thing. And so to have Virgil himself speaking Dante's Italian lines, I mean, it's, 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 it's almost like he's claiming this kind of uh, imprimatur, right, of Virgil himself. So it's, um, uh, it's kind of fun, right? And it also does, Tomas, as you're, uh, as you're um, pointing out, um, uh, he contextualizes Virgil in the Italian context, that is in the Italian political context, right? Um, talking about where he comes from, you know, the Mantua, where he comes from, Virgil, where Virgil comes from and, and all that stuff. And yes, he does kind of retroactively, Tomas, as you're suggesting, kind of place Virgil in the context of, you know, 13th century Italian, you know, politics and demographics. Um, but again, notice, notice the effect of that, right? It's like, me and Virgil, right? We Italians, right? Here we are. We're both Italians. We're from different states, right? You know, I'm from Florence. He's from Mantua. But you know what? Um, uh, it's um, it's all good. Uh, I, again, it, it, he instead of saying like, "I shall go back and tread in," you know, like a, you know, stroll in the classical glades of Virgil, he's bringing Virgil into his world. Right. And having him speak his language. Um, so anyway, it, it's as is often fairly common with Dante, there is an element of humility in it. And I totally agree with the point that Lee was making there. And I think it's a really important one. Um, but at the same time, it's also a pretty big brag uh, and uh, a major elevation of his own work as well. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure not to forget Lee's tweet. Um, so it was on my mind right before I started class. And I wanted to I just got like another tweet before I started class. And I'm like, oh, I got to remember. Uh, anyway. Um, OK. 
I don't, I don't, I don't I'm sorry to kind of open that can of worms from the very start, but I'm very forgetful. And once I get like focused in the text, I'm liable to forget. So I wanted to make sure to, uh, uh, to talk about that. So, um, let's jump straight into the text, uh, because, uh, this, uh, today's, Today's like a test case for me. I want to, this is our first day. Uh, I mean, I know, you know, many of you are thinking, well, we didn't get, so we got through like nine lines of Canto one uh, in one week. So if uh, at nine lines per week, how long is this going to take us? Um, that was different. We had introductory material to cover last time. So today is our test case, our first pure text from one end to the next. And let's see how many slides we get through today and then I'll have a better idea of how much trouble we're in uh, for the rest of the schedule. Okay. Starting at line 10, here we go. I cannot clearly say how I had entered the wood. I was so full of sleep just at the point where I abandoned the true path. But when I had reached the bottom of a hill, it rose along the boundary of the valley that has harassed my heart with so much fear. I looked on high and saw its shoulders clothed already by the rays of that same planet which serves to lead men straight along all roads. At this my fear was somewhat quieted, for through the night of sorrow that I had spent, the lake within my heart felt terror present. And just as he who, with exhausted breath, having escaped from sea to shore, turns back to watch the dangerous waters he has quit, so did my spirit, still a fugitive, turn back to look intently at the pass that never has let any man survive. Okay, what's going on with Dante's journey? Where are we? How do we understand this? Um... Uh, so a few things to kind of sort of contextualize here, right? Uh, remember the date, right? We talked about that last time. That gets established later on, so it's like a bit of a spoiler, but we might as well talk about it from the beginning. Um, uh, sun is rising. Remember I said last time, what day is it? What is the day that is dawning where he's seeing the light on the shoulders of the hill? Good Friday, exactly. It is the morning of Good Friday, which means the night of fear that has just passed was... All sorts of quizzes. Maundy Thursday, yes, exactly. Maundy Thursday, um, that's just it. Um, what happened on the night, Maundy Thursday? What's the evening before Good Friday famous for? What should we be thinking about associating... With especially like the dark and the dark before dawn uh, that he's just been walking through here in particular. Exactly. Jesus in Gethsemane. Jesus in the betrayal. Um, but especially Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and uh, his own, you know, uncertainty and uh, sweating blood and all that kind of thing. Right. Um, so that framework um, is interesting here. Right. Now, on the one hand, like. Um, Good Friday dawns is like not universally cheerful, uh, of course, when we're following, uh, you know, when we're paralleling the uh, progression of Christ, because that's when we transition from, you know, concern and fear about what's to come to what is in fact to come, right? We go from, um, uh, from uh, you know, prayer and waiting to actual betrayal and subsequent trial and crucifixion. Um, but um, anyway, yeah, so uh, uh, David Atley is thinking, should we, we be thinking about a cock crow at all? I mean, yeah, uh, I don't see, I don't see much reference in this early frame, in, in Canto 1 especially, uh, to betrayal, right? Now, of course, like, David, it's worth remembering that we're going to end up there. Right. Spoilers. Right. But spoilers are fine. Um, that's what the the, the betrayers are, are where we're going to end up our tour. Right. So that's that's where our book's going to end. Um, so we're not starting with betrayal, which you'd think we would. Right. In a sense, we're, that, that's sort of the moment that we're parallel with. But it is interesting to me that the moment that is sort of most directly parallel, right? This transition, like right before the day comes, um, you know, right before Good Friday dawns, this is the moment, right? When, uh, again, in the, in the parallel, in the story of Jesus, um, you know, Judas uh, brings uh, the guards and betrays Jesus with a kiss. 
Judas's betrayal, we shall be reminded of at the very end of Canto 34. Um, so there is a kind of betrayal framework in that way, but it's totally implicit. I don't see, he's not emphasizing, um, he's not emphasizing fear, or sorry, he's not emphasizing betrayal uh, in his, or in his experience, or uh, he's talking about, he's talking about fear um, and his, um, uh, his, uh, his sorrow as well, night of sorrow, he calls it, um, terror, exhaustion, sorrow, um, but, um, uh, and he's, and he's lost his way. Now, so again, remember, we can't, it's not, it's, it's, he's not just like retelling the Jesus story, right? I mean, Jesus hadn't lost his way in the garden of Gethsemane, right? You know, he hadn't abandoned the true path. Um, so again, he, he, it's not like he's retelling the Jesus story. Exactly. It's, it, there's just some, uh, sort of, um, uh, uh, parallels there. Um, but anyway, okay. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, well, Serena's asking, since there's so much talk um, uh, about what a mess Dante's in, um, how deeply he is in need of salvation uh, and everything, should we associate him with Judas? Well, I mean, Serena, that to me is the most, if I, if, if we do kind of back up and we look at the framework, right? I mean, if we, if we kind of do it the other way around, right? If when we get to the end of, um, uh, when we get to the end of, uh, Canto 34, right? And and we, we're going to see, spoilers, we're going we're gonna to meet Judas. Um, when we get to Judas at the end of Canto 34, it, we may, from that vantage point, remember, like, oh yeah, hang on a second. Wasn't it like right at the end of Monday, Thursday night that we, he began this whole process? So wasn't Dante in that sort of Judas betrayal place at the beginning and having seen that framework and kind of parallel? Serena, your question is an exactly logical one to follow up there and say, well, okay, if he's... In this moment, right, he seems less like Christ, perhaps, and more like Judas in some ways. Um, uh, that his own, his own straying, his own uh, again. It's not like an act of betrayal. He's not betraying anybody with a kiss. Again, it's not a really close parallel. Um, but, um, um, but I do. I think it's interesting to think about, especially when, when we look, and this is hard to do, especially from the vantage point of line 10, um, looking at sort of Dante's overall journey, right? But it's one of the things that I want us to be thinking about as we're going through. Um, what is, in a sense, remember if you know, remember the four different l levels, right? Like the literal level of the story, right? The literal level of the story is Dante's journey, right? The journey of this protagonist who's not the same as Dante, the person, the author, right? But Dante, the protagonist and his journey, but it's not just his physical journey. It's his spiritual journey. Well, obviously a tour through hell, purgatory and heaven is a spiritual journey almost by definition, right? But yet with him, we have both, right? It's both a physical journey as he's actually going on an actual sightseeing tour. But um, it's also a spiritual journey, his own spiritual journey um, in his own spiritual progress, as well as a guided tour. Um, and so therefore, Serena, imagining him beginning in a more Judas-like place, right? And ending up where he's going to end up, not in Inferno, but because that's not the end, but um, at the beatific vision of God at the end of Paradiso. Spoilers again. Um uh, then, you know, that's, uh, it, it is interesting to think of. And of course, um, uh, E. McKee on Twitch was saying very sensibly, uh, and I think, you know, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're thinking in exactly the right way, E. McKee, um, that it also does the whole betrayal thing and the Judas thing also does map onto there might, it might not be suggested on the, um, on the sort of literal level here in the story, because like the Dante character describes his experiences and things, but on the political level, it is. Because, of course, Dante, like Jesus, has been betrayed by those whom he trusted, right? He's been kicked out of Florence, um, and his banishment from Florence is a kind of betrayal. Um, he was uh, he, not exactly betrayed with a kiss, but like, you know, the, the, the shoe doesn't not fit, right? Anyway, so yeah, on that level, I think that we can see some interesting things there. Um, so that's a, that's a really, really good, um, that's a really good uh, uh, thought there. Um, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, good. Um, yeah, oh, good. Serena, you were thinking very similar things, that he's, he's in this way, he's on one level, like in the, on the literal level, he's more of a parallel to Judas, right? Like, you know, the, the lost soul, right? Who's left abandoned the true path and, and uh, has, as you said, Jameson, has already, like in the past tense, passed through uh, the past that never has let any man survive, right? It's like he's already, it's almost as if the wood that he's in is, is death itself or, or the beginning of death itself, Um which, of course, is also sort of appropriate thinking of the Judas parallel, as Stephen was suggesting, because, yes, Judas did hang himself. Uh, you know, Judas' suicide happens on uh, on Good Friday as well. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, anyhow, so. Um, uh, OK, and on the little. Uh, so, yeah, Serena, that's right. I was going to say on the literal level, Dante, the character is kind of, is in that Judas place. Right. But on the. Um, you know, on the on the on the political level, like on the uh, the political slash anagogical level, right? He's like Jesus, and remember, that's exactly the kind of contradiction that is totally cool in doing this kind of allegorical interpretation. Like we don't, we're not worried about that kind of thing when the same when the same character both is playing the Judas role in one version of the allegory and the Jesus role in, in a different layer of the allegory. It's it's good. That's there's no problems at all with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, OK. Anyway. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, those other things I was going to talk about. Oh, yeah. So uh, two techniques that I wanted to point to. Um, one is, um, of course, first we should notice uh, the epic poem technique that he is deploying here very swiftly. Um, just as he who, with exhausted breath, having escaped from sea to shore, turns back to watch the dangerous waters he has quit, so did my spirit still as a fugitive turn back to look intently at the past that never has let any man survive. Um, epic similes of that kind are, he's going to, uh, he's going to be very interested uh, in epic similes of that kind. And he does, he does a lot of them and he often does them quite well. Um, notice the sort of interesting effect of this one. So did my spirit is the is the part of that one that I am most interested in. Um, is his spirit the protagonist? Because this is a dream, vision, spiritual experience, right? Not like he's not there in the body. Is he is he in the body or is he not in the body? Right. Uh, that's I probably not in the body. This is a vision. Right. So his spirit, like it's only his spirit. Right. Or maybe he is in the body. Right. As Charon is going to object to taking him in the in the in the in the boat because he's too heavy like Aeneas was. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, the, 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 it's but. You know, so, like, what does he exactly mean when he says, so did my spirit still a fugitive turn back to look intently at the past? Does that merely mean like the spirit that was within me stirred me to look back or does he mean that? person who was my spirit within this vision turned and looked back, right? Um, in other words, he's doing this epic simile, which is a comparison, right? I'm comparing the one in order to help you to understand this one thing. I'm going to do this protracted simile. And the longer the simile is, the more kind of the more detail we get about it, the more fixed the idea of it is uh, in some ways. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's it's different to say, right? I mean, what makes an epic simile an epic simile? A comparison, a simile is just comparing two things, right? If he just said, um, and I turned and looked back like a shipwrecked person looks back out to sea, right? Um, he would convey the thing, right? That's what he's comparing. But notice by giving, by widening it into an epic simile, he invests the comparison with this narrative force, right? Just as he who, with exhausted breath, having escaped from sea to shore, turns back to watch the dangerous waters he had quit, right? It sort of puts you into the whole frame of mind. It's not just, I'm going to invoke the image or concept of shipwrecked person finally on land, right? 
I'm going to, and I'm going to draw your, I'm going to include narrative there, which draws your attention to particular elements of that experience. So, so in this way, I always find anyway, there are other effects too, obviously, but I always find that epic similes are sort of much more precise in that way. They, they, they provide you with so many more cues because you get this little story inside the story. Right. Um, and when we're told it was just like that. Right. Then we have um, this kind of extra, well, extra layer of narrative kind of superimposed on top of it. Um, but um, uh, anyway, um, uh, what was the other thing I was going to say about the epic simile? Oh, yeah. Um, Tom, of course, is very right in remembering. Uh, and uh, um, uh, Tom uh, is uh unusually equipped and those of you who are similarly equipped will benefit from it um uh that is equipped with good a oh, good working knowledge of the aeneid uh, because of, needlessly <laughs> surprise surprise the dude who makes virgil one of his main characters is really interested in the aeneid right so the aeneid is pretty heavily involved in the narrative here and of course the beginning uh of um, the aeneid book one of the aeneid you know, one of the, 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 the things that dominates book one of the Aeneid is the story of a storm at sea and people being wrecked on shore. Um, so he is also putting himself in that way explicitly in Aeneas's position. Um, he's paralleling himself with Aeneas there, but that's not all that he does. Again, he's just, he, he um, invites us to think of the, the woods that he's passing through, um, which again, he's describing... To say he's describing them vaguely is such a banal way of saying it, but there's it's not he's not giving us a lot of detail about this forest, right? It's a concept that he is evoking, right? The association of of being lost, of abandoning, and, and not just getting lost, but abandoning the true path of this one way. Jameson, the passage that you were pointing out about not letting anybody survive this sort of one way path into death, uh, the associations with fear and uh, and the darkness, you know, in which you are afraid, um, uh, and all of these things. But he's layering on top of that associations with Aeneas being thrown off course and shipwrecked when he thought he was almost towards the end of his journey and then gets uh, 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 thrown off again. Um, uh, so this idea of so what does that parallel suggest? Like, OK, so he's kind of evoking you know, book one of the Aeneid, so what? Well, apart from, again, the fact that he is once more kind of taking his book and Virgil's book and saying, look, compare, um, you know, weigh this with that, right? Um, you know, read this with that in your other hand. Um, he's also telling us something about the journey, right? I mean, the Aeneid is about a lot of things, but one of the main thrusts of the story, right, is this, the predestined journey, the preordained journey, Um Aeneas fulfilling his destined role and his destined role is sort of achieving this journey. There's, there is a big thing that he is not even control of that he has to accomplish. Right. So, um, in some ways the Aeneid parallel almost, well, it doesn't undermine exactly, but it, it invests this fear, darkness, confusion. I don't know where I am or what I'm doing or what's going on and what might happen to me, which is the whole atmosphere of the beginning. It invests that with a certain kind of dramatic irony, right? Because if that whole experience, if this whole Darkwood experience is like the storm at the beginning of the Aeneid, um, that you're looking back out to sea at after you've landed, uh, then it suggests that it's in fact not this is not his terminal destination, right? He's not going to die here. Uh, this isn't the dismal, horrible, and terrifying end of his road. This is merely a sidetrack on the predestined journey that he's going to take, which, of course, it turns out is true. He is, in fact, ordained being called uh, to this journey, uh, that though he doesn't yet know exactly what the, um, what the point of that is. Like, he doesn't know that he's been called yet, but anyway. Um, and yeah, absolutely, the foreshadowing of Aeneas' journey to the underworld. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I, there was something else I wanted to say. Mm, no, yes. Um, one of the things... <laughs> 
<laughs> this might be a false dichotomy uh, or a, a, a sort of um, clumsy and um, I, I don't want, I don't want to character you know sort of categorize things rigidly in this way in, in any in any way but um, I wanted to kind of help. Because I know that Dante's writing is very elusive, right? He's making allusions all over the place. And a lot of the times he's just expecting you to get them. So, you know, I talked last time about that twitchy impulse that you get when reading Dante to go look in the notes right away um, and see what it is he's that he's really talking about. Um, some of that comes from the fact that most of us modern folk don't get all of his references, whether it's because we're not familiar with 13th century Flor uh, you know, uh, 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 Florentine politics, or whether it's uh, because we don't know the Aeneid as well as he does, or, you know, like we're not getting his intense, uh, you know, uh, layers of biblical and classical allusions. Um, you know, there's there's all kinds of reasons why we might not get the illusions, even illusions which Dante himself might assume that it, that an informed reader would get. Um, so uh, that's hard. But there are also so there are some times when he's making an illusion that we're supposed to be able to figure out that we should be able to figure out. And there are other times that he is making an illusion that I think are supposed to be um, uncertain Right. That I, I, I don't think that there is an obvious answer that is like, well, obviously what he was referring to here is that like in some places we can say that, though, those can sometimes be misleading, because although it is true that sometimes he's clearly referring to a thing, that doesn't mean that's the only thing he's referring to, because, um, again, multiple layers. But um, but then there are some other times when I think he's not doing that. This is an example of him using sort of indirect speech. In order, but he's not trying to conceal this, right? So when he says, I looked on high and I saw its shoulders, that is the hill, clothed already by the rays of that same planet which serves to lead men straight along all roads. Why does he say that? So, first of all, what's he, what planet is he talking about? What's he, what's he, what's he talking about? The sun. He's talking about the sun. Yeah. It's sunrise. Translation, the sun is coming up and I can see the sun on the hill, right? Now, why does he do that? Why does he say, why didn't you say the sun? Why Why does he, why, why the, the, again, like you can say, well, he's talking about the wood the way that he is because he's trying to evoke all these other things. Why, why be so indirect about this? Do, is it because he, he's like trying to like, conceal it in some way? No, I don't think he's trying to conceal it. I don't think that he's this. I don't think this is one of those illusions that's supposed to puzzle you. It's supposed to be like, Ooh, I wonder what he's referring to with the planet. Like which planet could that be? No, it's the sun. It's just, he's talking about sunrise. That's all he's talking about. Right? So why does he talk about it like this? Well, the indirection, right? It's not just for the sake of being indirect. There's a lot of things you could say about the sun, right? The sun is associated with a lot of different things. What does he like? What is the effect of him descri his describing the sun in this way? That same planet which serves to lead men straight along all roads, right? Well, it clearly corresponds um, to what he um, uh, what he was just describing about the wood and his path through the wood, right? I mean, it's certainly seems no coincidence that having just said that he's abandoned the true path, right? Um, he's lost the path that does not stray, as he said in the first nine lines, right? And now he says he's abandoned the true path. And then he calls the sun that planet which serves to lead men straight along all roads. That which, like, helps you to find roads and, roads and to see the right path. Um, he is alluding to not just, it's, it's not, only sunrise, right? He does accomplish that, but he also suggests the, a, a sort of talking about light, you know, the, the light of the sun as a symbol of the guidance, the spiritual guidance that he is about to receive, right? Um, it's almost like he's doing the first half of an analogy or an epic simile, right? Just as the sun, which, when it arises, um, leads a, 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 a wanderer who has left the path in the dark and found himself lost in the woods can, by the light of the sun, discover his way once again, so I, 
met Virgil and he took me on this path to Beatrice and I found my spiritual way, right? Um, the second half of the, of the epic simile or the second half of the analogy is going to be played out for a long time, but it's, but it's, it's almost like it's setting it up in that way. So you see how it, what I mean by how it can, it sort of works that way. Um, but again, I don't think that he is here being, um, uh, uh, merely cryptic or trying to kind of make an obscure symbol out of something that is simple. He's by doing this, he adds, this is how he adds different layers of meaning. Um, in one way of thinking about lines like this is to say, you know, I, I've said, I've claimed he is writing a story on these fourfold, you know, at least four layers of allegory, right? He is writing a story which can be read and interpreted in these multiple ways at once. Well, how do you do that? Like, I mean, like, how? Like, what does that look like when it's at home, right? Like, what's that process like when, to, you know, to write a story in that way? Well, like this. This is one of the kinds of techniques that he uses. By doing this, he's already saying at least two or three things, right? If he just said, then the sun came up, okay, right? we could do some extra stuff ourselves. We could put some stuff into it ourselves, right? We could be like, okay, right. And the sun is probably a symbol of, I mean, we could kind of go all English teacher on it, right? Uh, and do that ourselves. But he's guiding us. Because remember, this is not just allegory that we are, you know, drawing from it. This is not just readerly allegory. He's doing the readerly model, but as a writer, right? Um. Anyway, so... Uh, Okay. Anyhow, so I, uh, yeah, let me move on. <laughs> Remember, I'm timing myself. How many slides I can get through? And anyway, I wanted to use that to transition into this slide. Anyway, um, skipping down a bit. This is the the as he's going to try to go up uh, the hill, and uh, he runs into trouble. The time was the beginning of the morning. The sun was rising now in fellowship with the same stars that had escorted it when divine love first moved those things of beauty, so that the hour and the gentle season gave me good cause for hopefulness on seeing that beast before me with his speckled skin. But hope was hardly to prevent the fear I felt when I beheld a lion. His head held high and ravenous with hunger. Even the air about him seemed to shudder. This lion seemed to make his way against me. And then a she-wolf showed herself. She seemed to carry every craving in her leanness. She had already brought despair to many. The very sight of her so weighted me with fearfulness that I abandoned hope of ever climbing up that mountain slope. Okay, now this is an example of him speaking obscurely in a way that I don't think we're supposed to understand. That is, it's not in the same category. Right. Like, like when he says like that planet, which guides people, we're supposed to be like, OK, right. The sun. Right. I get it. Now, we're supposed to get more than that, but we're supposed to get that. Right. Um, there are other places where he's going to be, again, making like allusions to uh, to Virgil or to uh, Ovid or to the Bible. And we're supposed to get that, too. This is a different category. What is the beast? What are these three different beasts, right? There's the leopard thing, speckled skin thing that's uphill from him. And then there's the lion, its head held high and ravenous with hunger. Uh, and the air around him seemed to shudder. Okay. Um, maybe a growl or roar of some kind. And then there's the she-wolf, um, whatever that is, Um she seemed to carry every craving in her leanness. She had already brought despair to many. Um, this, this has, um, the, the bits about the she-wolf there, that has, uh, it sounds like personification allegory, right? Um, I'd be waiting for somebody, you know, if this were like the Romance of the Rose or Every Man or something like that, I would expect, I, I'd expect a label at some point, right? Then a she-wolf showed herself. She seemed to carry every craving in her leanness and had already brought despair to many. And her name was Avarice, for instance, right? Uh, 
could be. I could imagine avarice being described that way in a medieval allegory, um, like if it's a if it's a if it's a vices and virtues kind of kind of allegory, kind of personification allegory. Right now, he doesn't do that. He doesn't identify the she wolf here. And what is the effect of that? This is not I don't think this is a reference we're supposed to get. I don't think we're supposed to be reading those three lines and being like, oh, man, boy, like she might as well be wearing a sign around her neck. Right. How obvious that is. It's, that's not the case. Right. There are. Lots of things that she could be, right? Um, it, uh, yes. Um, uh, yeah, the, sure, several people talking about, uh, you know, the connection between the wolf, the, the wolf and Rome, especially, of course, a she-wolf who, uh, you know, of course, famously suckled Romulus and Remus. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Associated with Rome. Empire or Pope? Well, Pope, probably. Probably the She-Wolf is a dig at the Pope. I can totally buy that, right? The Pope, it's... I remember I talked about betrayal and Judas and kisses. It's the, it's the Pope. Um, the Pope is the bad guy, politically speaking, um, in Dante's world. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, is the Pope the lean She-Wolf... Um, characterized as carrying every cra craving in her leanness, right? So uh, uh, sort of shrunken and yet craving, um, bringing despair to many. Yeah, sure. Is there a moral signification of that? Like I was suggesting something like avarice. Oh, hey, speaking of the Pope. Anyway, yeah. So like there's, yeah, sure. Yeah. D do they work separately? Sure. Do they work together? Absolutely. They work together. Um, do they work in other ways as well? Absolutely. This is... The kind of thing that and, and again, so to me, I'm a little I'm I'm a little bit less interested now. OK, I shouldn't say I, I was about to say I'm a little bit less interested in like really trying to like get to the bottom of what all of these things could mean. I am interested on that. But of course, should we do that? We will never end <laughs> this discussion. Right. Remember, there's no I don't think there is a single word in the comedy that has not had like an entire like symposium dedicated to it. OK, so um, uh, I, it's um, uh, it's um, it's yeah, there's 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 lots and lots here. And I don't think no matter how long we talked about it, we will exhaust any of the like all of the possibilities of what it could be and how it could work. That's why Dante is so much fun to talk about and why so many people have spent so much time talking about it. Um, but um, uh, because, again, that's the to me, this is like the real triumph of Dante's allegorical mode. He succeeds in doing this remarkable, remarkable thing. He succeeds in composing allegory of the poet of the of the of the theologians rather um he he succeeds in composing in that mode that had always merely been a way of reading and he does so in a way which like the allegory of the poets conveys the other layer of meaning except the multiple other layers of meaning all at once right and yet at the same time does not participate to kind of allude back again to Tolkien's slighting phrase um, is not merely the purposed domination of the author. There is also um, you you remain free. In fact, not only free. Um, I was going to say challenged. That's not even right. Almost um, impelled by Dante's writing to continue doing this work. Right. I mean, how hard is it to read this passage and not sit here and be like, okay, 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 hang on, hang on. I've got a theory. i got a theory of who the whelpert can be and who the lion can be and who the wolf can be, right? I mean, it's like a, it's, it's like a puzzle that demands an answer, right? You can't just leave it aside. You've got to come up with it. And then, and, and, and okay, oh, but i got to make it consistent. Okay, so if it's political, how can the three of them be, but if it's moral, right, how are the three of them, so if the wolf is maybe avarice, right, I just kind of threw that out there, but maybe that's it. Uh, and then, in which case, what's the, the, the lion is holding its head high. So pride, probably, right, ravenous pride. Um, and um, 
because uh, pride is hungry, just as you know, and, and, but in a different way from avarice. And then the leopard would be, what would the leopard be? Speckled and so, right? So you do this, right? And then you're, oh, 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 but wait, I've got the political ones, and now I've got the moral ones. How do they, are they commentaries on each other, right? Do they work? And wait, there's more. <laughs> oh my goodness! Like so, you see, like that's that's what winning looks like. <laughs> If, when you're Dante, right? Um, that's exactly what you're trying to create. So that's what I mean when I say, um, that's what I mean when I say that um, it's not, this is, the, these are not references that we're supposed to get. So you have to be careful. And, and that's another reason that I want you to try to resist on your first reading and maybe also on your second reading. I want you to try to resist that twitchy impulse to go and look in the notes, right? Um, and it's hard because sometimes you kind of need it because he's he does assume you're going to get it right. Like he, he's he's going to assume that you know that he's talking about the sun in that planet line right from the previous passage. Um, so sometimes if you don't get the illusion that he's thinking you're going to get, you know, it's you just be like, hang on, I don't even understand what's happening here. There's some planet, okay? Like what the heck? Um, so I know that can be really hard, um, but at the same time, you don't want to read this, but if you read this passage and all you're thinking of is the particular pet theory of whichever commentator you're reading, and it might be a very educated and a very convincing theory, um, uh, it may even be a perfectly correct theory, but you're not going to have the sort of experience that you're supposed to have there. Um, however, um, I am, uh, I am, <laughs> you guys are awesome. I, uh, I want to, I want to like acknowledge the comments that you guys are all making just by saying yes, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> okay, people are like isn't the you know the lion a symbol of Venice? Oh, wait, but Jesus was compared to a lion. Yep, keep it coming, <laughs> keep it coming. That's I mean not literally because I'm not we're, we're not gonna we don't have time to talk about it. But yeah, they did exactly do that, do that, and isn't it fun? Um, so a lot of this is um. You know, we're, we're, we're not going to be kind of working everything out as we go through. And, and you know, we're not going to end, you know, our discussion of Inferno with, a you know, a thorough understanding of all of the things that he's working out here. I'm not even really going to try. My hope is just to kind of help to, like, I'm um, just, it's more like a guided tour, right? You know, think of me like Virgil, right? <laughs> Leading you along the way, uh, pointing out things and explaining things that might need to be explained, answering some questions that you might have. Uh, but the true signification of it, right, that is that is yours. Just as Dante is the one on the spiritual uh, 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 journey, right? It's not Virgil who's on the spiritual journey. So, um, so there's an extra allegorical layer on top of our class experience as well. Well, thank you, Serena. I appreciate your hope that I will make it all the way to paradise and not be left behind. Um, that, I, that, is, that, that is a kindly hope uh, that I shall not be like Virgil in that way. Um, but anyway, okay. So um, that's what I mostly wanted to talk about. I don't, that's, we're, there's a lot more that we could do, but um, um, okay. All right. All right. One, one last point about this passage and then we'll move on. Um, those first four lines. The time was the beginning of the morning. The sun was rising now in fellowship with the same stars that escorted it when divine love first moved those things of beauty. Anybody know what that means? That is if that is those four lines are translatable in two words. Well, Catherine, you did it in one. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> Catherine says springtime. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's March. <laughs> it's, I think I wonder. I, that is so. Everybody knows that creation happened in the spring, um, and um, so the sun was rising in fellowship with the same stars. What is that referring to? That is referring to the astrological sign, right? It's referring to the time of year. The the constellation that the sun is in, 
right? So meaning the sun is rising and being escorted. You can't see them, right? But it's being escorted by these stars. So what are the stars that surround the sun? In other words, in what astrological sign is the sun rising at that moment? Oh, the ones that escorted it when divine love first moved those things of beauty. In other words, at the time of creation, when the whole universe started as spinning, right? The sun was in that place too. So when was it in creation? Uh, what sign was the sun in at creation? Aries. So there you go, right? Um, Dante loves astronomy, loves astronomy. I used to joke when I was, um, uh, as many of you know, when I was an undergraduate, I double majored. I went to a liberal arts college and double majored in English and astrophysics. Uh, and I used to joke when people would say, um, uh, when people would say, um, uh, what are you going to do with that? Right. Uh, I would usually joke, study Dante, uh, because it's kind of true. Um, but, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, Celia asks, how do we, how do we know creation happened in the spring? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. I don't even remember who claimed that, but it's accepted. It's accepted wisdom at this point. Um, I, I think it mostly poetically appealed to them. I think uh, this like a, a, a um, exactly Bruce. That's just exactly the poetic appeal I was thinking of myself um, that um, uh, the, the parallel between the, the sort of poetic parallel between Easter and creation uh, is, I think, the primary thing that drove the popularity of that idea. Um, I don't... Um, I don't... I can't remember the authoritative source of that. There was one. Somebody agreed that this is... Um, and I think it was... I can't remember. I can't remember. If I guess, I'm going to get it wrong, so I should just not guess. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah, yeah, I am. Um, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, sorry. So yeah, so I can't, I can't really answer. That, but I know that there was. I, no, I'll have to see if I can find it, but I'm not sure I can. Um, but anyway, yeah, no, it's just, uh, it is, it is, uh, commonly accepted teaching at this point that that's when creation happened. That kind of circumlocution though, that he does in those first four lines when he, and, and he loves, this is going to be a motif. Uh, Dante is going to do this a lot though. As I recall, I think he does it more often in, I think he does it more often in, Purgatorio and Paradiso than he does in Inferno, but um, but he's gonna do like Dante never just gives the time of day ever. He never is just like so. It was nine o'clock, and no, he always describes that using astronomy in some way, like to give the time of day or the day of the month or the year or the time. He always does this kind of thing. Why? Not just to be cute, right? What is the, um, uh, what is the, uh, um, uh, what is the overall like trend of these things? Well, the overall trend of these. Notice how he places this moment in time, right? Um, uh, the time was the beginning of the morning. The sun was rising now, and he's giving you the time of day followed by the time of year, right? But he's doing so in a way that puts it in this, like, in the context of all of creation, right? Um, reminding of the cycles of the world. And yes, of course, the stars are in the same place that they were in at creation. I forget who asked that question. Um, but um, absolutely, yeah. The stars are fixed. Everybody knows that. Um, you've got the fixed stars who have been in the same relation to each other, uh, always, right? So you got the fixed stars. They don't move. Everybody knows that. And... Um, uh, anyway, so, uh, so yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that's a given. Um, but, um, but anyway, 
in doing this, and in especially in doing this kind of thing repeatedly, he is placing his story, both literally the story that he is telling and the story of, like, the little hymn protagonist, right, in this celestial, divine, and even eternal context, right? Um, reminding us that the rising of the sun on this day is yet another motion of the divine love that has inspired all of the motion of the heavens since the time of creation, right? Um, one of the effects, one of the sort of moral or spiritual effects of this kind of tendency, I think, is um, it kind of reminds me of the famous passage from Julian of Norwich, um, the vision that she has of God holding... Uh, it's the vision of God and God holding something that is about the size of a nut in his palm. Uh, and she asks him, what is that? And he says, it is all that has been created. Um, he is holding all of creation in the palm of his hand and it's about the size of an acorn. Um, that image, right? That kind of framework, right? Kind of stepping back and looking at the whole framework of things. Um, this reminder, right? That any given day, every day that happens is part of, is not only you know, yet one more motion of this big picture that God has been in control of from the beginning. But why does the sun rise? The sun rises because it is moved by divine love. And we're being reminded of that, that these things, the planets and the stars are things of beauty. And they are things of beauty that move in the way that they do. And their motions themselves are beautiful and ornate and intricate. And all of this happens because of divine love. It is the love of God which literally makes the world go round. Um, well, makes everything else go around the world uh, in medieval cosmology. Uh, uh, it is the spontaneous love of his creation for him uh, and his love for the creation which makes the spheres of the celestial spheres turn. Um, so being reminded that everything, literally everything that has happened and literally everything that ever has happened since creation has all been moved and inspired by the love of God. We get that reverent, that, that recollection as a kind of freebie when he's telling us the date, right? And that's the kind of thing that he does a lot. Yes, uh, William and Devorah are both of them uh, remembering Boethius's love poem. Yes, you should. Absolutely, you should. Um, uh, that is exactly the stuff that Dante is thinking of and working with here. Um, uh, anyway, okay. Um, let's keep going. While I retreated down to lower ground, before my eyes there suddenly appeared one who seemed faint because of the long silence. When I saw him in that vast wilderness, have pity on me, were the words I cried. Whatever you may be, a shade, a man, he answered me, not man, I once was man. Both of my parents came from Lombardy, and both claimed Mantua as native city, and I was born, though late, sub Julio, and lived in Rome under the, God, under the good Augustus, the season of the false and lying gods. I was a poet. And I sang the righteous son of Anchises, who had come from Troy when flames destroyed the pride of Ilium. But why do you return to wretchedness? Why not climb up the mountain of delight, the origin and cause of every joy? All right. We have our hero, or at least our hero's number one hero. Um... Uh, so I know it might seem frustrating, but I know it's going to happen a lot in our discussion of Dante. There will be many times when I'm going to look at a line and I'm going to say, wow, isn't that line evocative? Aren't there lots of ways we could take that? And then I'm going to kind of leave it because, again, like it's not it is not my part to like try to lay out exhaustive interpretations of all of these things. That is uh that is not the role that I am claiming for myself as your guide in this discussion. Um, but boy, that line, one who seemed faint because of the long silence. Oh, man. One who seemed faint because of the long silence. Even on the literal level, what does that mean? Right? Faint? Like, is he hard to see because he's been silent for a long time? 
is he hard to hear because he's Dante's been like deafened by the silence? Um, I, exactly. Michael's like, who's been silent? He's been silent. Is it because he's not spoken in a long time? And so his voice is faint because he's speaking for the first time and his voice is being heard for the first time in a long time. Or is it because Dante's been silent for a long time? Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, who man, man, man. Um, <laughs> so much there, so much there. Um, one who seemed faint because of the long. And then of course, once we sort those things out, that's Virgil's introduction, right? It is thus that he chooses to introduce Virgil, the poet, his guide, right? Um, one who seemed faint because of the long silence. On another level, is it he seems faint because of the long, in the sense that like, though people have been reading Virgil quite a lot for quite a long time by this point. Um, yet he's not really been heard in a long time because people have been failing to really understand Virgil. And so he seems faint because now like his real meaning, his real importance is distant, right? Because of the sort of long silence. So many possibilities. And yes, E. McKee, he's been dead for a long time too, right? This guy's been dead for a thousand years. So um, that that also is a long silence, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, um, I don't, see, I, I don't think, it's certainly not true. <clears throat> Nobody would claim that uh, Virgil is unknown or, 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 you know, that his like popularity had started to wane. Um, his pop, he's um, still maintaining his spot on the bestseller charts in general, I would say. Um, now it's possible that he could be alluding to a more kind of local fad uh, that is perhaps, uh, I don't know anything about this, but you know, it's, I mean, I can imagine conceivably he could say something like that if what he means is like in our like literary coterie, um, you know, it's kind of fallen out of fashion to really read and love Virgil lately and like we should revive that fashion. Um, that's possible, but big picture, Virgil is, you know, the, uh, you know, the second most read secular author. No, I mean, well, the most read classical author, period. Um, keep in mind, we'll get to this. Never mind. We'll get to this. Well, we'll see if we get to this tonight. I was going to talk about Homer, but I'll talk about Homer when we meet him. Um, uh, anyway, so, yeah, there's... Um, uh, yeah, Jameson takes it as a spiritual silence, the silence of lingering in limbo. Sure, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um yeah, yeah. Um, right. No, Bruce, I tend, rather than Virgil has become unpopular lately, but that's a shame. I would read it as more likely as what Bruce just said. The kids today aren't reading their Virgil like they should or aren't reading it, I would add, Bruce, in the way that they should. They're not appreciating it as they should. Right. Um, yeah, that I could that I could see that I could see. Um, Oh, sorry, Michael. Yeah, no, let's address that right away. Um, when I talk about most read authors and stuff, and, and uh, Michael is asking very sensibly about the, like, aren't most people in the Middle Ages illiterate? So in what sense is that? Um, the literacy rate in the Middle Ages is very misleading. Um, we are still primarily an oral culture in the Middle Ages. It's really not until the printing press that that's going to change. Books, written books, one does read written books, right? Some people do read written books on account of, you can tell, because they know the stories and they continue them. But um, but no, that's not... the, the We're still primarily an oral culture. Um, you don't need that many books, nor that many people who can read. If there's only a few people in the town, even one, who can read, that doesn't mean... That means there can be a lively uh, literature uh, and appreciation of literature in the town because you only need one person who can read it, right, aloud. Um, and reading silently, at period, 
does not seem to be a thing, at least not a very prominent thing. Um, that is, even if you're just by yourself in a room reading, you're probably going to read it out loud as you go. Um, and of course, if you're going to read it out loud as you go, there might well be an audience there. Um, so um, the correlation between um, uh, the correlation between literacy and engagement with stories and with literature is very misleading, very misleading. Um, so this is, um, uh, it just, yeah, so that, that, that I think is, is a really important thing. Um, stories were very popular, right? And of course, many people who didn't, who couldn't read them, could still tell them, right? Um, and might have, would have heard them read and would retell the story. Um, and this is one of the reasons I think why the dominant literary trope in the Middle Ages, dominant, is the retold story, right? What do we do in medieval literature? We retell stories that have been told before, right? Whether you're Chaucer retelling Boccaccio's story, who's retelling Petrarch's story, right? Uh, or whether you're, um, you know, writing the old French version of the story of uh, the Aeneid, right? Uh, the Roman Deneas, uh, or, or whatever it is that you're doing, right? You are... Um, that that was by far the most popular thing, so popular that, of course, when Chaucer uh, made his most original poem, in some senses, uh, uh, Troilus and Crusade, his longest complete poem, he was adapting that too, of course. Um, but he makes up a fake author who is his source and uh, goes back and attributes the bits that he makes up most, in, like the places where he deviates most from his actual source, Boccaccio. Uh, he uh, he attributes most forcibly to Lollius, his fake source, because um, like retelling stories, that's what you do. Um, but um, exactly, Serena, it's fanfic all the way down. But again, this this is why I, I think this is why because this is this is the culture, right? Um, Everyone still likes story, and I don't say everyone. That's a big statement, but stories are still really popular, right? Reading book books are still really popular. It's just people aren't reading them; they're hearing them read, and they're then telling them to each other. And so, storytelling is in that way a more active, a more adaptive, and a more interactive, a more dynamic kind of literary experience. I think that people are. Some of this is just my own theory about the Middle Ages. Some of this is pretty demonstrable, I think. Um, but anyway, so sorry. Thank you for that. That I, that was a digression. I was meaning to go on at, at some point or other uh, because it's something that is uh, important. And by the way, um, this is one of the other effects of Dante's text. Um, on the one hand, it's in Italian, so it can be read on the street and everyone in the street can understand it, right? So yeah, you don't have to translate it or anything. You just like read Dante's original text and everybody can hear Dante's words and hear Dante's story and be affected by it, right? But if you paraphrase it, you'll screw it up because you'll mess up the rhyme scheme, right? So the rhyme scheme kind of preserves the integrity of the whole, of the whole poem, right? Or at least it'll help you to spot it if you're getting a defective or a, uh, uh, a, a knockoff version, Right. Uh, of, if this is not the if this is not the real Dante, you'll know because the terza rima won't flow. Um, so it kind of he kind of goes. He both makes it easier for his story to circulate, you know, for his poem to circulate. But he also, you know, one effect of terza rima, I think, is a kind of safeguard, right, uh, to preserve the integrity of his story in its original form. Um, and Gerald, I do suspect that the rhyme scheme would help memory too, but I think Terza Rima would help memory a little bit less than it because it's so intricate. Um, I'm not sure. I would have to ask somebody who had memorized more verse than I whether or not a complicated verse scheme like this is more of a help or a hindrance to recitation of recite of of memorized verses. Um, it might be. It might be, but I could see it being a hindrance too in some ways. But uh, uh, anyway, yeah. Um, so yeah, Michael, you're right that if every retelling alters it somewhat, the original becomes silent through attrition. Yes, I agree. Now, of course, Dante is 
in some ways, making sure it doesn't happen with his story. But if you're going back to Virgil here, yeah. But I mean, he was still, I mean, Virgil's still what you read. Anyone who's educated, right? Anyone who's learned Latin, which is anybody who's been educated, because that's the first thing that happens when you start learning stuff. Um, where do you begin education? The trivium, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, right? What's grammar? Grammar means learning language. What is that? That means learning Latin, right? And how do you learn Latin? Or, you know, and why do you learn Latin? In order to read Virgil. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, okay. Um, Yes. So uh, Stephen asks, is there a significance to the number of lines in each canto? Uh, Stephen, I will say many have thought so. There are some who have found patterns in the, the, the lengths of each canto and believe it to be specifically structured in a particular way. Yes. Um, I don't have that off the top of my head, and I'm not 100% sure I'm completely convinced of it either, but look, I wouldn't put it past Dante. Like, there's very little in that sort of way, in the way of organized structure and composition. There's very little that I'm not prepared to to give Dante the benefit of the doubt in that, at least that it's a thing that he... I certainly don't be like, oh, nobody could do that. Yeah, I would not dismiss Dante in that way. Um, but, um, but yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, Kit says, my grandmother used to be able to recite Dante. She had maybe a third grade education. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It does not take formal schooling in order to know stories, repeat stories, appreciate stories, um, analyze stories, discuss stories, right? So anyway, okay. All right. No, I'm not moving on because I barely talked about this this passage. Okay. I only just wondered at that one line. Um Somebody tell me about the significance of Virgil's first words. Uh, what are Virgil's famous first words? Virgil's famous, not here. I mean in Virgil. Virgil's famous first words. How does the opening of the Aeneid go? Yeah, no, not call me Ishmael. That's a different one, Stephen. Uh, yes, yes, I sing of arms and a man. Yes, I sing of arms and a man is the traditional translation of the first line. Um, um, yes. Um, so the reference to a man, the man, right? No articles in Latin. Um uh, virum, virumque, I think, is the word, and man, right? Uh, uh, yes, arms and the man I sing is the more literal, uh, uh, yes, um, exactly. Um, yeah, so uh, that his first things, that his first words are not man, right? Um, his, his very opening words are saying, I'm not the man, I'm not the not the man. I'm not the man, <laughs> right? His, the first line of of uh, of the Aeneid says, "I sing of arms and the, and the man." And so, of course, like the great sort of question, right? That you know what he's building to in that first line is like, "What is the man that he is singing of?" Right? What is uh, who's the man? Is kind of the implied question that underlies the first line uh, of the Aeneid, and the very first thing that Dante's Virgil says. Um, is uh, not the man. <laughs> not the man. It's not me, right? Um, I once was man, right? But I, but I, I, I gave that up some time ago. Um, so he, his first move is one of humility, right? And one of humility, which I won't say it reverses the first line of the Aeneid. It's more complicated than that, of course. Um, but. Um, it's not merely a reversal. It's not merely a, a, a negating of it. Um, but, um, I mean, I once was man is different from saying I'm not the man. Um, but um, uh, anyway, um, so. But it's very striking. Right. I mean, again, when you when you know the Aeneid as well, I mean, there are going to be very few people who are going to be reading this you know, off the the sheet on which it is written 
who did not memorize those opening lines of the Aeneid, right? So, I mean, this is uh, very, very famous. Uh, that Virgil first says, not man, I once was man, um, is going to is going to strike everybody. So that he has Virgil and not quite reverse himself, but he is he starts with a negation, not not man um, uh, is um, uh, is is important. Yeah. Um, I once was man, but now I'm not. Yeah. Um, Arthur, exactly. Um, both of my parents came from Lombardy and both claimed Mantua as native city. And I was born, though late, sub Julio and lived in Rome under the good Augustus, the season of the false and lying gods. I was a poet, and I sang of the righteous, son, the, the righteous son of Anchises, who had come from Troy when flames destroyed the pride of Ilium. Um, and my goodness, uh, who had come from Troy when flames destroyed the pride of Ilium. For those of you who know the Aeneid, does that sound like Virgil to you? <laughs> Does that sound like something Virgil would say? Hey, you know, kind of in some ways, but um, um, let's just say that's not how Aeneas talks about Troy, right? The pride that when flames destroyed the pride, like I sang Aeneas when he came from Troy, when Troy got its comeuppance, right? I mean, that's not literally what he says, but it's like in that direction, right? Um, in other words. We're hearing from Virgil. This is Virgil, right? The Virgil we all know. But this is Virgil who now has things in a different context, right? The season of the false and lying gods. Um, Virgil, Virgil doesn't see things quite the same anymore that he once saw, right? So is he that Virgil? In a sense, of course, yeah, this is him, right? This is, this is the guy who wrote that, who wrote that poem. But this is also not that guy. Right. This is also um, uh, this is a guy who now has been uh, um, reinformed about that, who has done some reprioritization of things since uh, that time, since he was alive. Right. Which, again, then comes back to not man. I once was man. Right. I'm something different now. I'm in the post-human experience now, right? And therefore, I see things very differently than I did when I was a man. Um, yeah, yes. Uh, Stephen, uh, yeah, uh, he lived under Augustus, so was Virgil alive during Jesus' childhood, or did he die just before? Oh, it's close. So this, oh my goodness, we talked about this a lot in the Middle Ages, because there is this one passage in Virgil, not in the Aeneid. Uh, it's in the Eclogues. I'm pretty sure it's in the Eclogues. Yeah, it's in the Eclogues. In which Virgil makes a prophecy, which was probably originally intended as a piece of flattery for the child of a wealthy couple. Um, basically, it's like, and like your child is going to be awesome and do amazing things someday, is the kind of passage that it sort of seems to be, but it's very beautiful, and it's very it sounds very portentous, and holy cow, it sounds like a prophecy of the birth of Christ. I mean, he nails it, right? And so, oh my goodness, there are centuries worth of medieval dudes who read this passage and they're like, he knew, like Virgil is vouchsafed, uh, and this is happening like decades, like right before the birth of Jesus. So like it's it's like he was vouchsafed a vision of the coming Christ. Like this is obviously about Christ. And um, and so there are some people who are like, maybe Virgil is saved. Right. Maybe he had a prophetic experience. You know, maybe he was. You know, and then there were others who were like, yeah, well, mm, no, Um so uh, anyway, it's uh, it's it's there, there. There was a lot of talk about this, and there's gonna uh, there. Dante will allude to that um, uh, at uh, at various points, but um, anyway, we'll get there. We'll get there. I think we'll get there. Um, 
Why do you return to wretchedness? Why not climb the mountain of delight? Um, I'm here to guide you. Um, okay, well, let's just keep going. Let's keep going. Okay. And are you then that Virgil? You, the fountain that freely pours so rich a stream of speech? I answered him with shame upon my brow. O oh, light and honor of all other poets, may my long study and the intense love that made me search your volume serve me now. You are my master and my author. You, the only one from whom my writing drew the noble style for which I have been honored. You see the beast that made me turn aside. Help me, O oh famous sage, to stand against her, for she has made my blood and pulses shudder. It is another path that you must take, he answered when he saw my tearfulness. If you would leave this savage wilderness, the beast that is the cause of your outcry allows no man to pass along her track, but blocks him to the point of death. Her nature is so squalid, so malicious, that she can never sate her greedy will. When she has fed, she's hungrier than ever. Once again, fueling the allegorical interpretations of who exactly, or what exactly, or what things exactly the she-wolf is. Um... This is a very famous passage, the Are You Then That Virgil? Uh, you, the fountain that freely pours so rich a stream of speech. This is a very, very famous passage, his praise of Virgil here. O oh, light and honor of all other poets, the shame upon his brow. Um, uh, we have um, a, uh, uh, a beautiful... Um, yeah, Devorah, <clears throat> I promise you, uh, I, I say this without a shadow of doubt or uncertainty that Don, that C.S. Lewis was thinking of these lines when he wrote that passage in the last uh, in the Great Divorce when he meets George MacDonald. Yes, yes. I mean, it's I mean the parallel is very clear where George MacDonald leads him on a on a tour, right, and uh, uh, and sort of serves as Virgil to his Dante in the Great Divorce. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, absolutely. The, uh, this is the passage that he's almost paraphrasing uh, when uh, he wishes to say all these things to George MacDonald, but can't find the right words because he's not Dante, right? Um, anyway, yeah, yeah. No, this is that's absolutely the parallel. Uh, you're right to remember that. Um, and Bruce, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to bias things too heavily, but uh, at the risk of doing so, I would say, Bruce, if ever it seems like Dante's uh, Dante might be doing a bit of a humble brag, uh, yeah, <laughs> almost always. In fact, I would even go so far as to say there are very few times when Dante says humble things uh, that are not also kind of humble brags as well. Um, that, yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, now, Lee, that's a really wonderful point. Lee says, you wouldn't necessarily think a dead poet would be a great defense against a she-wolf, even a spiritual she-wolf of avarice or of papal turpitude or whatever. Um uh, yes, ex you wouldn't, right? Normally, but this is Virgil Lee we're talking about, right? I mean, okay, so um, he can help. Why can he help? Because Virgil is not only famous for his poetic style, right? Virgil is famous for his wisdom, his morality, his piety, right? He can be a guide. He, he's the perfect guide. Right. The perfect guide, one poet to another perfect guide. Right. Um, the perfect guide in 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 moral training. Virgil, like the Aeneid was, in fact, used for moral training. The whole um, multiple layer, you know, the whole uh, allegory of the theologians was applied to Virgil as well. And so there were lots of I mean, there's nothing more uplifting for young boys to read uh, than Virgil. Um, uh, because of, you know, the strong morality. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, Serena's thinking about Charles Williams' poem, Taliesin on the Death of Virgil, in which Virgil's readers posthumously save his soul. Oh, man. Oh, man. Uh, that's, um, yeah. I, they, no, they were all into, the, 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 uh, Dante and Virgil were 
uninterest of uh, many of the Inklings. Um, Tolkien, least of the lot, I think, but still not uninterested uh, in Dante. Um, yeah. <laughs> Tom Hill says, still isn't. Still isn't anything more uh, more, uh, more instructive uh, for young people to read. Absolutely. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, okay. So, um, let's see. What else was I... But, Lee, anyway, b b back to the point that you were sort of fixing in on, right? He fanboys for a little bit, right? And then he immediately turns to Dante for help in his trouble, right? I'm surrounded by carnivores. Help me, Virgil, right? Um, he has the instinctive sense, right, um, that Virgil obviously is going to be able to assist him. Um, so although it might seem counterintuitive that a dead poet is just what you need, uh, when you're being menaced by a gigantic and probably allegorical she-wolf, um, Dante knows that in fact that's what he needs. And of course, immediately, um, you know, Virgil says, it is another path you must take if you would leave this savage wilderness. Dante is, of course, perfectly right. I can show you, though, of course I can show you the way out of this, right? As I have guided generations of young people through the wilderness of, you know, their, their teenage years. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, okay, let's, um, we'll keep going. Therefore, I think and judge it best for you to follow me, and I shall guide you, taking you from this place through an eternal place, where you shall hear the howls of desperation and see the ancient spirits in their pain as each of them laments his second death. And you shall see those souls who are content within the fire, for they hope to reach, wherever they, whenever that may be, the blessed people." If you would then ascend as high as these, a soul more worthy than I will I am will guide you. I'll leave you in her care when I depart, because that emperor who reigns above, since I have been rebellious to his law, will not allow me entry to his city. He governs everywhere, but rules from there. There is his city, his high capital. Oh, happy those he chooses to be there. So this is Virgil's plan. This is the this is the guy. This is the preview. Right. This is the um, you know, this is the, the the dumb show in which we act out the scene before the scene. Right. He's just given the spoiler of the whole uh, whole thing. Right. Um, this, by the way, this is not allegorical. Uh, this is indirect speak, but it's not allegorical speak. He means you to understand what he's talking about here. Um, I shall guide you, taking you from this place to where? An eternal place where you shall hear the howls of desperation and see the ancient spirits in their pain as each of them laments his second death. That's hell. Hell is the second death, right? They've died once physically. Now they are dying spiritually for all eternity. That's their second death, their desperation, ancient spirits in their pain. It's an eternal place. Uh, sounds like hell. Got it. Okay. And you shall see those souls who are content within the fire, for they hope to reach, whenever that may be, the blessed people. Okay, souls within fire, in pain, being punished, but wait, they're content. They're not in des there are no howls of desperation here. They are content within their fire. Why? Because they hope to reach the blessed people. They have hopes for ultimate salvation. Purgatory is what he's describing there. Uh, purgatory, just very brief over you when I want to get too deep into purgatory right now. Uh, purgatory is the transitional place. 100% of souls in purgatory are going to heaven. It is the, it is the entry way into heaven. You go to purgatory first, you are purged, you are cleansed. It's a cleansing process. You are cleansed of your sins and then you go among the blessed people. Some people are there for a long time. Some people there are, are there for less time. Um, it's a cleansing process, but it's not. Some people get real confused and talk about purgatory in deeply confused ways, um, including like 90% of Protestants. Um, but I know that I'm with you, but, but, uh, uh, but, but it's, it's people will talk about, pur will confuse purgatory and limbo, for instance, totally, totally different. Purgatory is like, there's, there's the line, right? 
that like damned, not damned, right? Everybody in hell is on the bad side of that dividing line. Everybody in purgatory and paradise are on the other side of the line. 100% of people in purgatory are bound for heaven eventually. It's just a question of when they'll get there, when they are finished getting cleaned up. Um, so those are the sp ancient, sp uh, the, uh, the, not the ancient spirits in their pain, um, those, the, the, the souls who are content within the fire, right? And then the blessed people. If you would then ascend as high as these, that is, the blessed people who are in paradise, right, then a soul more worthy than I am will guide you. So he says, I'm going to guide you through both hell and purgatory. But I can't guide you into paradise, right? That's above my pay grade. Um, somebody more worthy than I will have to guide you. I can't go to paradise. Don't have an entry ticket. I've been rebellious to his law. I've not been granted entrance into God's city. He governs everywhere but rules from there. There is his city, paradise. Again, this is like my indirect talking about paradise, about describing heaven, his high capital. Oh, happy those he chooses to be there. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. David says, would the controversy regarding the selling of indulgences have started to fester by Dante's time, or is that only later? Oh, no. It started... I mean, it's gonna fester more later on, but it's it's we'll get there. We'll 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 see some evidence uh, before we're done here uh, of that kind of thing. Um, okay, good. Veronica says, "Why can Virgil go to purgatory if he does not qualify for heaven?" That is an excellent question. I don't know. Uh, well, that is to say, so like purgatory is he he can't he he doesn't live in purgatory like he can, but apparently it's okay for him to see it. He can't go to heaven. He can't travel there at all, uh, but he can go to purgatory. It almost seems, Veronica, like a kind of special grace given to Virgil for Dante's sake in order to guide him. Um, but um, we'll, if we ever talk about purgatory later on, um, we'll definitely look at that because um, it's an interesting dynamic in looking at... The, like. Virgil's role in Purgatory compared to Inferno and his relationship with Dante there. And then, of course, the big finish. The the handover, right, happens uh, at the end. The sign-out, right, at the end of Purgatory um, is a really, really uh, interesting and important moment. Um, yeah, so, okay. Um, yep. Yeah. yeah, exactly, Stephen. It's... it's Purgatory is still on Earth, basically. Um, uh, if you want to know where um, Purgatory is, the the penguins are hiding it. It's at the South Pole. Now you know. Uh, spilled the beans, but we'll get there someday, maybe. Okay. And I replied, O poet, by that God whom you had never come to know, I beg you that I may flee this evil and worse evils, to lead me to the place of which you spoke, that I may see the gateway of St. Peter and those whom you describe as sorrowful. Then he set out, and I moved on behind him. Dante's submission. O poet, I beg you. Um, notice, though, the frame there, right? Um... Notice the frame that uh, it's uh, O poet, I beg you, frames by that God whom you had never come to know. Um, he invokes him, right, by the God who didn't save you, right? Uh, so he's begging He's submitting to Dante, right? I commend myself to your instruction and your guidance um, while also acknowledging that he, that is um, Virgil, doesn't know God, right? Um, he's a guide, but he doesn't know where he's going in a sense, right? He can't go to the destination, Um it's a really interesting... I find this combination really interesting. That I may flee this evil and worse evils. 
lead me to the place of which you spoke, that I may escape the this dark wood and these fierce beasts. Take me to hell. Show me hell. Hell is the means of escape for Dante. It's the beginning of his spiritual journey. It's a way of making sort of literal the... Um, um, uh, um, yeah, it's a way of making literal um, his where he was spiritually, right? It's kind of like, let me play out the journey from where my, like right now I've lost the path that does not stray, right? I'm, I'm, um, this is going to be my destiny if I'm not careful, right? Hell. Um, but it's also kind of Virgil's hometown now, right? He might, he might be from Mantua originally, but for the last thousand years, he's been living in hell. Um, and so, no, um, Virgil will not get to heaven eventually. He is not in purgatory. He, he, ha- he gets a day pass to visit purgatory, Virgil does, but he is not in purgatory. He is in hell. That's, um, he's, he, he's, uh, he's on the one-way trip. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I'm on the move. I'm on the move. Hey, Canto 2, how about that? That's exciting. The day was now departing. The dark air released the living beings of the earth from work and weariness, and I myself alone prepared to undergo the battle both of the journeying and of the pity, which memory, mistaking not, shall show. O muses, O high genius, help me now. O memory that set down what I saw, here shall your excellence reveal itself. Who's he invoking? He's invoking the muses. O muses, O high genius. Um, help me now. O memory that set down what I saw. O memory? Um, now, I have to be a little bit careful. If a different, if a later poet uttered that line, O muses, O high genius, help me now. If, um, Byron or Shelley said that, they would mean my genius, Right? They'd be talking about themselves, um, uh, you know, like the uh, like, uh, you know, I have nothing to declare but my genius uh, uh, line. Uh, that's Oscar Wilde, I believe. But, you know, that that kind of thing. Right. Um, yeah. If Byron had said that line, that's what he would have meant, I think. Um, but um, that is not what um, uh, that is not what Dante, I believe, means by high genius. Um, uh, memory is, of course, uh, uh, memory is, wait, I gotta make sure I get this right. Memory is the mother of the muses. Is that correct? Memory? Um, yes. Okay. All right. Good. Now, you're making sure I'm remembering that correctly. Uh, uh, my own getting the illusions is rusty these days. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, yes, Namazani. Yes, exactly. Um, high genius might well be genius, capital G. Uh, that is the god of um, generation, of... Genius is depicted in the Romance of the Rose, which was already around and quite popular by this time. Um, Greatest modern bestseller of the Middle Ages. Um, Okay, in the Romance of the Rose, Jean de Meun depicts genius as bringing forth material which he gives to the goddess Natura, nature, who is at her forge, hammering them into shape. So you've got 
the substance of matter, and you've got the form into which matter is put. Genius brings forth the matter. Nature forms it into shapes. Um, so, um, when he's invoking high genius here, I think one of the things that he's implying here in invoking the muses collectively and memory, the mother of the muses, um, and then in the middle, high genius, he may well be thinking of the god genius, that concept of the god of generation, of like childbirth and procreation, but but also just generation and like the production of like that genius to help him produce the stuff. His job as poet is to be the maker. He's it's he's playing the role of nature here, right? He's giving a shape to it. He's the one with the hammer and the forge in the making of this poem, if we extend, uh, if we apply, rather, um, the metaphor from the Romance of the Rose or the allegory of the Romance of the Rose. Not all of it, just that bit. Um, sorry, for those of you who don't know, the Romance of the Rose is a very popular love poem, uh, and, and it's very dirty. Anyway, never mind. Um, there's, it's, it's really complicated, <laughs> but there's, there's, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of sex involved. Anyway, point is, um, he, uh, so yeah, I, I do see the masculine and feminine, uh, thing, Serena, very much, um, with genius and, and nemosyne there, um, you know, genius and memory, um, also as sort of like these, in a sense, you know, sort of, sort of these, these sort of, Design, divine faculties that are informing his own. On the one hand, he needs to remember, like to set down what I saw. This is my experience, right? This was my vision. This was what happened to me. And so I, I, I'm, I'm invoking memory to help me to, uh, to, to, to hold on to these things, to set down what I saw. Um, but also again, high genius to feed him matter, I believe. Um, uh, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Stephen says it also kind of sounds similar to the Holy Spirit moving scriptural authors. Doesn't it, though? Doesn't it, though? Um, yeah. And, David, it is absolutely also possible that high genius means God. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, genius, the God genius, uh, that concept, I mean, sort of semi-God, divine concept sort of thing, is also connected with God himself. Yeah, absolutely. As the ultimate genial figure. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the dark air released the living beings of the earth from work and weariness, and I myself alone prepared to undergo the battle, both of the journeying and of the pity. I love that. Notice how even that description... Notice how that description, like, explicitly points to the multiple levels, right? Um, the battle. like So, the journey is like a battle, right? But the battle is a battle of journeying and of pity. Oh, man. It's like, you know, the literal level, the moral level, um, the, meta the allegorical level. Um, it's, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whew. Serena asks, did Milton know Dante? I can't imagine Milton didn't know Dante. I mean, it's possible, but I can't imagine it. He must have known Dante. I don't know Milton well enough to be able to think off the top of my head, to be able to prove it off the top of my head, like if he like, clearly alludes to him or if we, if we know... But, um, yeah, no, they didn't hang out, Arthur. Sorry, that's a very English professor way of talking. Um, uh, just meaning, had he read Dante, of course. Um, not that they, not that they hung out. Um, uh, but, um, yeah, I can't, I can't, I, 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 I can't imagine it. I can't imagine it. Um, uh, yeah. Um, pity is going to be an interesting point as we're journeying through hell, um, both of the journeying and of the pity. Dante's response to the souls that he is going to meet in hell 
is going to be variable. Um, it's uh, uh, sometimes will be piteous and sometimes less so. Um, and that's but that makes it very interesting that he describes the battle of the pity. I think that's an important context for us to keep in mind. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, sir. Does uh, Milton know Dante now? Maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, uh, is there somewhere where they're going to be hanging out like we see the literary coterie uh, uh, down in limbo? We'll see. Um, okay. But Dante's a little bit concerned, right? He has doubts. He's saying to Virgil, but, but why should I go there? Who sanctions it? For, for I am not Aeneas. I am not Paul. Nor I, nor I, nor others think myself so worthy. Therefore, if I consent to start this journey, I fear my venture may be wild and empty. You're wise. You know far more than what I say. And just as he who unwills what he wills and shifts what he intends to seek new ends so that he's drawn from what he had begun, so was I in the midst of that dark land, because with all my thinking, I annulled the task I had so quickly undertaken. Here's Dante wavering, right? Um, yes, yeah, Stephen says, I'm not Aeneas, I'm not Paul, isn't exactly a high bar for humility. <laughs> no, it's really not, is it? Um, now, so Jennifer asks an, a wonderful question. Did Paul take a trip to hell? Why are we paralleling, um, why are we paralleling um, Paul and Aeneas? Like, okay, I get Aeneas. Aeneas went to the underworld, right? Okay, but why Paul? Why does he bring Paul into it? Um, can anybody explain that? Paul got a guided tour, right? Um, he went to, he didn't go to hell. Um, Paul went to heaven. He got a guided tour of heaven. And so remember he, when he's setting out on the journey here, he's been told already where he's going, right? Hell is just step one. So he's not Aeneas. He's going to do what Aeneas did. He's going to go to the underworld, right? And so he, it's already enough to say, I'm not Aeneas, right? I mean, I'm going to be doing what Aeneas does, but I'm not, I'm not Aeneas. But then you're saying that after that, I'm going to go up and I'm going to give a tour of heaven like Paul. Um, when was Paul's tour of heaven? Good, good, good question. Second Corinthians 12, I want to say. I know a man, um, whether in the body or not in the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, um, who was taken up into the third heaven and shown things. Um, that was, you know, oh, Stephen was typing it out as I was trying to quote it from memory. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, that, uh, that passage was universally understood in the Middle Ages to be a circumlocution of Paul speaking of himself, um, that it was a, 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 a humility gesture for Paul to say, you know, I know a man who did this, like that was, but it was like not he wasn't really trying to keep it a secret it was just it was just like a, a rhetorical technique of his to introduce it that way second corinthians 12 oh i nailed it okay um um yeah okay um i uh, yeah second corinthians 12 anyway that was universally understood to be um paul talking about his own experience that he was he had this visionary experience where he was I say given a guided tour, that's slightly flippant. He doesn't really say exactly what, other than that he was shown mysteries. Um, but um, but anyway, that that Paul was given this sort of experience, right? So in going to the underworld, he's like Aeneas. In going up to heaven, he's going to be like Paul. And, you know, uh, Virgil has just been telling him that it's like the whole gamut, right? He's going to be running the whole gamut here. Um, so this is why he's troubled here. And that's why he's paralleling himself in both uh, in both cases. Um, Bruce says Paul also humble brags a little bit, a little bit. I mean, he's not exactly boasting, but um, you know, I I I I, I hear you, I hear you. Um, but um, anyway, okay. So um, 
so this so he's 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 acknowledging the parallel here right like man okay so i'm supposed to be and but of course also in saying you know not only is saying i'm not aeneas i'm not paul not the most humble statement that anyone has ever made um uh stephen as you were suggesting but in addition by saying that he's also kind of pointing out and neither one of them did both <laughs> you know like Who's gotten the full tour? Oh, that's a small list. I think that's me. Well, no, not me. There's one other person who's been to all three, right? Uh, presumably, and that's Jesus. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yep. That's, there you go. There you go. Um, so, yes. Um, uh, nor I nor others think myself so worthy. Um, if I consent, I fear my venture may be wild and empty. Like, is it inappropriate? Like, is this a trick question? If I say, great, yeah, no, this is fantastic. In fact, this is just what I've been looking for. Um, uh, I think I have the, the did, you, did I show you my CV, right? I, I think I have the qualifications for this and I'm the perfect candidate for this role. Um, then that's a bad sign, right? If you start like that, then it's probably just going to be a wild and empty venture in fact, right? It's not going to be the kind of spiritual journey that it's supposed to be. Um, uh, so he's afraid of that. You're wise. You know far more than what I say. So remember, his first question is, who sanctions it? Well, why should I go there? His first question. His second question, who sanctions it, right? Like, why, why should I think this is okay? By what authority am I being invited to do this? Why should I think I should do this? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, if I have understood what you have said, replied the shade of that great-hearted one, your soul has been assailed by cowardice, which often weighs so heavily on a man, distracting him from honorable trials, as phantoms frighten beasts when shadows fall. That you may be delivered from this fear, I'll tell you why I came and what I heard when I first felt compassion for your pain. I was among those souls who are suspended— a lady called to me, so blessed, so lovely, that I implored to serve at her command. Okay, so we'll come to that in a second. Um, Virgil's response to Dante's humble concern here. Don't be a coward. Right? Your soul has been... If I understand you, if I'm tracking with you here, Dante, your soul has been assailed by cowardice. Right? And I get it. Right? Often... Cowardice weighs heavily on a man, distracting him from honorable trials. Like I get it, you're you're like a you're like a beast who's afraid of phantoms when shadows fall, right? I'm here to deliver you from this fear. Your uncertainty about whether or not you should go on this trip is itself like the dark forest that I'm like, yeah, like you've lost the path. Obviously, you've lost the. So now he's taking what instead of being like. Dante, you are so humble. And you know that's a really good sign. I'd have been worried if you were keen about going. He goes in the opposite direction of what we might think, right? And he's like, yeah, man, I understand your temptation to cowardice here, but let's get over this, shall we? Right? Come on now. Um, uh, stop being distracted, allowing yourself to be distracted from honorable trials. Stop reacting like a beast to phantoms. Um, I'm here to deliver you from this fear, this fear that you're, uh, that you're caught in, right? Um, why does he characterize this this way? Because he's coming in obedience. He, it has been sanctioned, right? As perhaps Dante should have trusted in any way without having to ask for Virgil's bona fides, right? Asking for, I mean, what's he asking for Virgil's permission slip, right? Virgil could well say something like, how do you think I got here in the first place, right? I don't exactly come on outings, you know, on the regular, right, on my own power. Uh, obviously, this has been orchestrated, right, from on high, or else it wouldn't be happening now, would it, Dante? Um, so, I mean, that, and that seems to me his sort of emphasis here. Um, but Virgil says, it's okay. I'll tell you my story. I'll tell you my story. Um... Uh, here's my story. 
I was among those souls who are suspended. <laughs> Which, don't worry, he's not actually hanging. Um, <laughs> once we get down like that, I could be taken more than one way, you know what I mean? But anyway, I, so I was down, you know, hanging with the folks in limbo. And a lady called to me, so blessed, so lovely, that I implored to serve at her command. Who's that? Oh, wait, don't read ahead. If we just read that, we stop at line 54 of Canto 2. Who is he talking about? Who's it sound like he's like, what? first guess? Not Galadriel, Stephen. <laughs> Who's he talking about? Who's he talking about? It totally sounds like the Virgin Mary, right? I mean, that's got to be your first guess, is that it's a lady so blessed, so lovely, that I implored to serve at her command. It's got to be Mary, right? Clearly, it's got to be Mary. Her eyes surpassed the splendor of the stars, and she began to speak to me so gently and softly with angelic voice. Okay, right? I'm still still tracking with the Marian thing. She said, O spirit of the courteous Mantuan, whose fame is still a presence in the world and shall endure as long as the world lasts, my friend, who has not been the friend of fortune, is hindered in his path along that lonely hillside. He has been turned aside by terror from all that I have heard of him in heaven. He is, I fear, already so astray that I have come to help him much too late. Go now, with your persuasive word, with all that is required to see that he escapes. Bring help to him, that I may be consoled. Now, we've still not been told exactly who the lady is, right? By this time, by the time we get down to line 69, we might perhaps have some doubts that this is actually the Virgin Mary, right? Um, I... She's his friend? In what way is she? She calls him her friend? Okay. Maybe. He was devoted to the Virgin in some way. Possible. Can't rule it out. Um, <clears throat> that I may be consoled? Okay. Well, the Mer Virgin Mary is the mother of compassion. Maybe she has great compassion for him. Um, I have come to help... I. I I fear that I've come to help him much too late. Um, it sounds a little bit less like the Virgin, but who could it be, right? Um, in heaven, there's a gentle lady. This is still Beatrice speaking. I No. Yeah, no, okay. No, this is Virgil again. In heaven, there's a gentle lady, one who weeps for the distress toward which I send you, so that stern judgment up above is shattered. And she it was, and it was she, who called upon Lucia, requesting of her, now your faithful one has need of you, and I commend him to you. Lucia, enemy of every cruelty, arose and made her way to where I was, sitting beside the venerable Rachel. No, this is, sorry, it is still Beatrice talking. Okay. She said, Lucia said, you keep, you're tracking with this? I've got three ladies here. You keeping track of the ladies? So the, la the, one, the one, lady number one was talking here, right? Lady number one was talking, and she says, in heaven there's a gentle lady, one who weeps for the distress toward which I send you. Who? It was she who called upon Lucia, requesting of her. Wait a second. That's the Virgin Mary. Okay. The stern judgment up above is shattered. Who weeps for the distress of the suffering and her weeping for the distress shatters the stern judgment up above. That's the Virgin Mary. Okay. So the Virgin Mary interceding for the suffering calls up Lucia, St. Lucia, um, oh, blanking. Lucia, the patron saint of, hmm, like, whoa. I'm forgetting. Somebody remind me, who's Lucia, the patron? Oh, right, yes, of, of light, of, like, the illumination from heaven, of eyes, uh, and of seeing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, um, Lucia says, 
Now your faithful one has need of you, and I commend him to you. Lucia, enemy of every cruelty, arose and made her way to where I was. Beatrice, sitting beside the venerable Rachel. That's where Beatrice hangs, with Rachel. Rachel, Jacob's wife from the Old Testament. This is Old Testament Rachel we're talking about. Um, she's hanging out with Rachel. Um, and she said, You, Beatrice, true praise of God, why have you not helped him who loves you so, that for your sake he's left the vulgar crowd? Do you not hear the anguish of his cry? Do you not see the death he wars against upon that river ruthless as the sea? No one within this world has ever been so quick to seek his good or flee his harm as I, when she had finished speaking thus, to come below, down from my blessed station, I trusted in your honest utterance, which honors you and those who've listened to you. Okay, so it's a little complicated, but apparently what happened was, this came from pretty close to the top. The Virgin Mary looks down, hearing the distress of the world, and she sees Dante, who's in trouble. And she says, hey, um, she says to St. Lucia, your faithful one has need of you. Dante's St. Lucia's faithful one, right? Okay, sure. And so she sends Mary, sends Lucia to Beatrice, where Beatrice is hanging out next to Rachel, right? Uh, and um, says to Beatrice, Hey, Beatrice, why have you not helped him who loves you so? He, he need, do you not hear the anguish in his cry? Do you not see the death he wars against in that river ruthless as the sea? Um, now, Jennifer says, Why didn't Mary just go talk to Beatrice? <laughs> right? <laughs> why the middle... The, well, not the middlemen, the middle ladies here, right? Um, Virgin Mary hears his distress, deputizes Lucia, draws Lucia's attention to it. Lucia goes to tell Beatrice. Beatrice is upset about it, goes and tells Virgil to go fetch him. That is the extremely direct mechanism by which this happens. Um... Uh, <laughs> Michael's answer to the question, why doesn't she just tell herself, is they're in seventh grade. No, no, no. No, it's not like that. Um, uh, it's uh, it's not that, like, you know, Mary can't go and tell Beatrice straight about it because they hang with different crowds and so I can't be seen associating with her directly. It might sound like that, but it's not quite like that. Um, uh This is how it works, is the short answer to the question. This is, this is, this is how it works. Um, there is a reason why the workings of heaven and the action of grace is understood in this way. Um, as someone who came from a Protestant upbringing, it took me a very long time to come to understand this. I think I understand it better now. Um, uh, the business about the saints was the hardest thing for me to understand about medieval Catholicism when I first began learning about medieval Catholicism. But my understanding of how and why this is understood to be working this way Um as Dante will show when we get to Paradiso, um, heaven is a community. Heaven is not God standing alone and acting. And by the way, there are also people there watching, right? Like he's got an audience in heaven. No, they are part uh, like that, you know, there's the the blessed souls are joined with God. They're part of the action now. They are that they are part of the mechanism of his grace. That's what it means for 
the blessed to be joined with God and in community with each other and in communion with God. Um, for God to involve them, all of them, from the Virgin Mary down to Beatrice. I say down to Beatrice not because she's the least, but because she's one of the most recent. Beatrice might be hanging out with Rachel, but they've not known each other long. She's only been there a couple years. Like seven, I think. Um, so, um, uh, anyway, yeah, that's, um, this is how heaven works. Um, some people sort of compare like the medieval Catholic concept of heaven to like a gigantic bureaucracy, you know, in which you've got to like know the right people and pull the right strings. And sometimes goodness knows it can certainly sound like that. Um, that is not, I think, a, a wholly inapt sort of, well, not description really so much as satire of the medieval conception. Um, it is a satire which is deserved in many places, but it is not the theory. It is not the concept. That's the con my understanding of the concept, is that it is, again, it is the community. They act. God's grace comes through them because that's what it means to be the body of Christ and for the body of Christ to be joined with the head uh, in heaven. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, and that is exactly why, Devora, if you're really a saint, you'll perform miracles. That's why the performance of miracles is the evidence, the inescapable evidence of sainthood. Inescapable in the sense that, like, only saints will perform, you know, only, like, saints when prayed upon will have, like, miracles will only happen under those circumstances, and all saints will perform miracles. Like, it will be, like, the two of them will join, will be together, right? Because they are part of the body now. They are, that is how the grace of God operates, is through his church, through his, through the body of Christ. And so we see it in action here. And ev not everybody, but there's a whole, you know, it takes a village to rescue Dante, you know, and that's what we see here. Um, all the ladies getting together, uh, this triumvirate of ladies, Mary, St. Lucia, Beatrice herself. Um, yes, with the, the uh, uh, Veronica is thinking of the phrase, the communion of, the communion of saints in, uh, uh, in the, uh, the, the Apostles' Creed. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. I was next going to talk about Beatrice and to answer the question that somebody was asking. Um, um... Um, I forget. It was a while back. Um, oh yeah, like, is Dante deliberately doing something with the courtly love tradition? Yes. Yes, he is. And I was going to answer that question next, but it is too late for that. Tune in next time when I explain what Dante is doing to the courtly love tradition, uh, finally uh like this is the beginning of the final move in what dante does uh with the, he's already done the opening act of his transformation of the courtly love tradition um this passage is the um uh the beginning of the consummation of what dante does with uh the courtly love tradition but more next time. Uh, so thanks, everybody. That was a middling performance <laughs> at best when it came to covering slides, but we did okay. Uh, we shall persevere. Um, odds of getting all the way to Canto 7 next time, comparatively low. But uh, but I make sure you read through at least... Uh, at least Canto 5, minimum 5. Um, I doubt we'll get much past 5 next time, but um, don't worry, we'll be caught up real soon. Um, so, yeah, anyway, but that's, so what we'll do, uh, um, we'll do at least, we'll finish up, polish up too, because we're all, 
almost done. And then uh, we'll we'll do uh, at least three, four, and five next time. That's that's absolute minimum we'll accomplish next time. Thanks everybody, and um, I will uh, I will see you guys next week. Have a good night now. Bye. The MythGuard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.